Good morning. Today we are going to continue our Revolutionary War lecture by looking at phase two of the war, when the war itself really begins. We've had the battles of Lexington and Concord, but those were mainly just, oh crap, the war is here. Today we're going to get our first actual battle of the war, and then we're going to unite as colonies in a common cause. The first battle, major battle, of the Revolutionary War is the Battle of Bunker Hill. The purpose of the Battle of Bunker Hill is to get control of the hills surrounding the city of Boston. This battle is going to take place on two main hills, Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill. The reason the British want these hills is that it's much easier to protect and defend a city when you have the high ground. It's also easier to fight against an enemy when you are sitting on top of a hill and they have to run up the hill while firing at you. When this battle starts, the British do not have control of the hills. The colonists actually have control of these hills. The British are going to try to run up the hills and crawl over the top of the hill to beat the colonists who are waiting for them dug in up top. Unfortunately for the British, they have to march up a pretty steep long hill, avoiding the fire and smoke that their own cannons have caused and avoid the shots being fired by the colonists at the top of the hill. The men involved in the British assaults are some of the best trained soldiers in the Revolutionary War. However, they don't stand a chance against the farmers, bankers, and businessmen that awaited them at the top of Bunker and Breed's Hills. Having high ground advantage is very, very successful in battle. So the British are going to be marching wave after wave on Bunkers and Breed's Hills. And you can see in this image that many of them are going to get shot and going to get injured. The colonists easily could have won this battle. However, the colonists are very, very low on supplies. At this point in the war, any supplies the colonists had had been illegally stolen from Great Britain. So, at this point, they're running very low on supplies. They run so low on supplies that by the time the British make a final assault, the colonists only have enough gunpowder to fire one more round. They are ordered to not fire until they see the whites of the eyes of the British. This is perhaps one of the most famous commands in American military history. The colonists are nervously awaiting the British as they march up the hill. And on this last assault, they fire only when they see the whites in their eyes. The British end up taking the hills. It's a British victory. However, to the British, it does not feel like a victory. Almost 50% of the British army face casualties. That means almost 50% were either wounded, captured, or killed. It's 50% of the best British soldiers in the army that were being killed by farmers and dentists and businessmen. The Americans, the colonists on the other hand, faced very, very small losses because they were protected by the hill. So technically it is a British victory because they captured the two hills and they met their objective, but it feels much more like a colonial victory because the colonists were able to kill so many important soldiers and were able to really wound the British army. Another importance to this battle is that it shows that the colonists are very low on supplies and that they're going to have to do something quickly to figure out how to get more supplies. 
Following the Battle of Bunker Hill, it is clear that a revolution is in place. It is clear that we are fighting to revolt against Great Britain. But what is not clear is what we want the end result to be. Do we want to rebel against Great Britain until they give us votes in Parliament? Do we want to rebel and form our own country? Do we want to be a country separate from Great Britain? Do we want to be associated with Great Britain? There's many questions left to be answered. We know we're revolting and we know we're angry. We just don't know what we want the end result to be. All of that changes when an Englishman named Thomas Paine moves to the colonies and publishes a pamphlet. Thomas Paine's famous pamphlet is going to be called Common Sense. Common Sense is going to create a common cause in the colonies. The main purpose of Common Sense is going to be to get the colonists to work together to revolt against Great Britain and form a separate American government and a separate American country. In Common Sense, he writes about how Great Britain has abused America time and time again, and there is no sense in staying a part of Great Britain. This book is going to inspire many colonial leaders to want to write the Declaration of Independence. This pamphlet is going to be widely published throughout the colonies, and later on in class today, you're going to read some excerpts of Common Sense. Thomas Paine does not stop writing after Common Sense. He goes on to write throughout the entire war to encourage people to keep fighting for this cause even though it's a very, very long and very bloody war. One of his most famous excerpts comes from another writing he did. In this excerpt, he talks about how tyranny is not easily conquered. Overthrowing somebody like King George III is not an easy task. And people that are fighting just to fight are not going to be successful. In fact, you need to be pretty tough and pretty hardcore and pretty dedicated to the cause to have any success. Take a moment to read the words of Thomas Paine and how he inspired colonists to fight for this cause. So Thomas Paine publishes Common Sense, and it is widely read throughout the colonies. Remember, Common Sense gives us a common cause. Which group of colonists would have supported Common Sense? Loyalists or Patriots? The answer to that one is Patriots. Patriots are going to read Common Sense, and it's going to give them that little boost they needed to finish their cause, and they're going to write the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was written and signed on July 4th, 1776. We are going to be going much more into depth with the Declaration of Independence over the next few days, but here are a few basic things that you need to know. The Declaration of Independence was written by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is a very famous man from Virginia. He's going to go on to be our third president. Thomas Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence by himself, but then meets with John Adams and Benjamin Franklin to edit the Declaration of Independence. It has four major points and major sections. The first, it talks about the natural rights theory. The idea that all humans are born with the rights to life, liberty, and property. We got this idea from John Locke. Thomas Jefferson is going to tweak that idea a little bit, and he's going to say all Americans deserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The second section is the arguments. It lists all the reasons why colonists believe they can leave. It's going to talk about things like when there's been a long train of abuses and when our rights are being taken away by a king, we have the right to overthrow this king. So it's really going to put the reasoning behind why they're doing the Declaration of Independence, not just because they're angry. 
The third section are the complaints. It lists everything King George III did that the colonists felt was a violation of their rights. Everything from the Quartering Act, where soldiers were living in our homes, to taxation without representation, to closing and trying to starve out the city of Boston. The final piece, and the piece that's most important, is the conclusion, where they establish the United States of America. They write time and time again in this section, free and independent states. So we declare that we are no longer colonies of Great Britain, but that we are the country of the United States of America. This itself is the Declaration of Independence, a single sheet of paper that is going to seal the fate of our country forever. We'll spend more time looking at this over the next few days. I will be posting some links to some videos on Brightspace so that you can watch those later. The final thing I want to talk to you about today is another thing that's going to inspire Americans to keep fighting. Now, remember, we're already two years into the war at this point, about a year and a half, and we're facing another six years of war. So even though we're very motivated, we're going to need little things to keep us going. One of these things is going to be a man named Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale is kind of a folk hero. He himself doesn't have a huge role in the Revolutionary War, but is going to die and inspire many people to fight on. Nathan Hale was a 21-year-old teacher who is going to quit teaching when the Revolutionary War breaks out and is going to command an elite group of rangers. George Washington is going to need a spy in New York City. Um, what we don't know about New York City yet, but we'll learn as the war goes on, it's a hotbed for loyalists. Remember that New York was originally founded by the king's brother. So spies in New York City are going to be very, very valuable. Washington's going to ask for many spies in New York City, and one of the first to volunteer is going to be Nathan Hale. Unfortunately for Nathan Hale, nothing about him speaks spy. He's extremely tall, over six foot. He's very, very, very large, about the size of a football player, and has flaming red hair. So he's not easy to hide in crowds or to hide out when he's almost about to be caught. Um, now, there's many different stories about how Nathan Hale gets caught, but it's in his first few weeks on the job um, that Nathan Hale is actually captured by the British. Most people believe that Nathan Hale was standing on the shore of Long Island signaling a boat that he believed was going to pick him up. The boat was actually full of British soldiers who arrest Nathan Hale and find spy papers on him. Nathan Hale immediately confesses to the crime, but rather than being given a trial, which is the, court, the norm for the day, you give trial to war criminals, Nathan Hale is immediately going to be executed the next day. Before Nathan Hale is put to death, however, the British give him a chance to say some final last words. In these last words, Nathan Hale says famously, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Nathan Hale's death inspires many Americans because he was killed without a trial. He was killed with once again liberty being taken away from us at the hands of the British. Also, his very poignant words, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country, inspires many Americans who weren't quite ready to fight and die to gather arms and join the American army against the British. After you've completed your OneNote notes for today, you will be completing a common sense activity. Thank you for listening.